So yeah, first of all, I would like to thank all the uh, organizer and also the uh, department heads for this workshop and uh, giving me the opportunity for uh, the talk here. Uh, the, the, my talk will be about the weak detection of signal in the spiked weakness model. And actually, um, this is a kind of easy to follow thing. So I think you can understand most of the things if you just focus on the things. And well, I believe this is kind of the simplest theorem I've ever proved in my whole career. Um, uh, this is the uh, joint work with Hewan Zhang in KAIST. So let me introduce the model. So this is simply the signal plus noise model. And signal is basically just the n-dimensional vector. And the noise is n by n real symmetric random matrix. So uh, you can just think about the uh, symmetric matrix, but all the entries are random. And then the signal plus noise model means that we have x, x transpose, so this is an n by n matrix, and plus this h. And here the co coefficient lambda is known as the signal to noise ratio. So this, uh, by controlling the size of this lambda, you can uh, uh, think of a different regimes where uh, the signal is much larger than the noise, or in some other cases, the noise is much larger than the signal. And then the question is, uh, given data m, so if you just know about this m, not uh, the not any information on this x or h, can you detect x, the signal? And of course, well, if you just think about naively, you can think that if the noise, uh, sorry, if the signal is much larger than the noise in terms of the matrix norm, then perhaps it's yes. And if the noise is much larger than the signal, then perhaps it's no. So you will not be able to recover the signal. But then the question is, what happens if this first part, the signal part and the noise part, are of equal strength? Uh, so here, we can use some uh, well-known theories from the random metric theory. So suppose that the signal has the Euclidean norm 1, and then the noise is uh, with mean 0 and the variance 1 over n. So if you fix this mean 0 and uh, variance 1 over n condition, then this matrix is known as the Wigner matrix. And it is well known that the matrix norm of this Wigner matrix is of order 1. Actually, it's almost like 2. And then our model is just lambda xx transpose plus h, which is m. And we want to consider the case where lambda is of order 1. And how to detect the signal? So first, the easiest one, easiest thing you can try is to find the largest eigenvalue of this matrix and to see whether this largest eigenvalue comes from the signal or from the noise. And then uh, the well-known theory is, says that the largest eigenvalue converges to square root of lambda plus 1 over square root of lambda in this case if lambda is bigger than 1. And well, you can easily check that this is bigger than 2 in that case. And if lambda is less than 1, then this will converge to 2. So you have a clear cut between something bigger than 2 and exactly 2. So if you just compute the largest eigenvalue of this model, then you can see whether the signal is there or not. This type of phenomen phenomenon was first introduced by uh, Benarus and Beck and Peche, and this is known as the BVP transition. But um, well, pre more precisely, actually, the BVP transition was first considered by those three people uh, for the sample covariance matrices, or the Wishart matrices. And for this Wigner setting, that was first considered by Peche in 2006. And uh, there are uh, many more papers regarding these properties. So this is all known. And then if you know that the signal is there, then you can also recover the signal vector itself by checking the large the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. So this corresponding eigenvector is strongly correlated with the signal x, uh, which is done by Benek, Georges, and Nara in 2011. So it's just all set. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that actually, if you just think about it without any random metric theory, this is quite a tough problem. Because if you think about this, the size of this x, x transpose, then because the norm is of order 1, exactly 1, so the typical size of the entry in x is 1 over root n. So if you have 1 over root n times 1 over root n, then the, the size is like 1 over n. But on the other hand, h is mean 0 and the uh, variance 1 over n random variable. So typical size of this random variable is of order 1 over root n. So if you just think about one single entry of this matrix, the noise is much bigger than the signal. The noise is of order 1 over root 10, but the signal is 1 over n. But yet, 
if you collect all the data and form a matrix, then now you can check whether the signal is present or not, and you can also recover the signal from the given information. I have a question. Yeah. What is this rank one refers to X, X transpose? Uh, why yeah. it's called the rank one? I repeat, I don't quite. Uh, oh, because X, X transpose is rank, rank but one. This is always <laughs> rank one, right? I mean, whether, irrespective of whether lambda is approximate one or not. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I mean, you you so can really refer to X X transpose. Yeah, yeah. So well, so if you just have H, then that is a Wigner matrix. Yeah. And if you just add this, then this is rank one spiked yeah. Wigner matrix. But you can also add something else here again. But then that becomes rank two spiked Wigner matrix, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So this rank one just means this the rank of the signal. Yeah. Yeah. But the last one is in the regime lambda greater than one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just talking about the yeah, yeah. The regime lambda is bigger than one. So when lambda is bigger than one, there's nothing to do. I mean, well, it's just simply all set and we, we know everything. And then the next question is, what happens if lambda is less than one? So as I said, if lambda is bigger than one, then you can just detect the largest eigenvalue, which is known as the principal component analysis in statistics. And if lambda is big, la less than one, people consider this problem as well. But then unfortunately, as you can imagine, the signal cannot be detected by PCA just by checking the largest eigenvalue. And then perhaps you want to find the test which gives you the signal by using not just one eigenvalue, but all the eigenvalues. But unfortunately, at least when the noise is Gaussian, you cannot do that if lambda is less than one. There is no way to reliably detect the presence of the signal, which was proved by Montanari and Reichmann and Zeitney in well, 2017. And then you can do perhaps even more complicated thing, not just using the eigenvalues, but using all the matrix entries. But even with that, you cannot make a test which can reliably detect the signal, uh, which that was proved this year by Ed Alawi, Chris Akka, and Jordan. So, well, one thing is that if the noise is non-Gaussian, then you can lower the threshold a little bit which was proved by Perry Wine, Bandera, and Moitra also, well, recently. But I will not go into the detail because, um, so this uh, kind of concerns about changing the matrix entries by using some nice functions to uh, practically enhance the size of the signal. So I mean, you can make some of the signal to noise uh, ratio a little larger by changing the matrix entries. But well, if you just forget about that part, and at least for the Gaussian case, you cannot do anything. So if lambda is less than one, you cannot detect the signal. So meaning the non-Gaussian is even better. Non-Gaussian is even better. Gaussian is our worst enemy when you when you want to detect the signal. Yeah, this is kind of weird thing, but well, actually it's just like that. But then we don't want to stop here the the story. So the next one we want to try to do is the weak detection of signal. So namely. We cannot detect the signal explicitly, exactly, but can you do something at least better than just a random guess about saying whether the signal is there or not? So our goal is pretty low. So we, we don't aim too much. So, so it's simply impossible to say with 100% sure that the signal is there or not. So we just want to say that, OK, with at least like 70% probability, we can say that the signal is present, something like that. So how can you do that? So first, there is something a uh, mathematically correct statement that if H is Gaussian with, uh, so uh, to be more precise, I need to separate the off diagonal terms and the diagonal terms of this noise. So off diagonal terms has this variance one over N, but the diagonal terms may have some little different variance like W2 over N. Uh, W2 doesn't matter much and in many cases you can think that this W2 is actually 1. But then the thing is that uh, historically the very first model considered in random matrix theory is Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And if you want to make this random matrix uh, kind of orthogonal, orthogonally invariant, I mean after taking the orthogonal transformation, if you don't want to change the distribution of the random matrix, then the variance of this diagonal entry must be 2 over n instead of 1 over n. So because of that reason, people want to also let this W2 can be any number, not just exactly one or two, but some maybe some uh, something else. 
So this is W2, and finally the fourth moment of this off-diagonal entry is W4 over N squared, but um, you can maybe just forget about it. And in the Gaussian case, the third moment of the Gaussian is 3. So in the Gaussian case, W4 is 3. Okay, with that in mind, we want to do the hypothesis testing. So the first hy all, uh, so null hypothesis is that lambda is 0. And the alternative hypothesis is lambda is bigger than one, 0. So signal is not there and signal is there. And you can, if you construct the optimal test, then the error from the optimal test converges to this. The, uh, the, the complementary error function with the argument 1 quarter square root of minus log 1 minus lambda. A little complicated and this is the definition of the complementary error function if you like. And this is 1 minus error function simply. And this is known but then the problem is that this is proved by using the likelihood ratio test. So by, uh, from the Neiman Pearson lemma, the likelihood, likelihood ratio test is the optimal test. So you cannot make a test which beats this. But nevertheless, the problem is that you cannot use this likelihood ratio test in actual problem because that is computationally just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so here's the mathematics. So what I thought was like, okay, so there is a test and the test theoretically gives us the best error rate. But then how can you actually construct a test which is doable and whose error rate is optimal? But if you just use largest eigenvalue, it's impossible. So let's just use all the eigenvalues. And how can you use the old eigenvalues? So if you just call the mu1 through mu n, the eigenvalues of this n by n random matrix, then you put all those eigenvalues into one function and let's just compute the sum of this. But then we know that this has the Gaussian fluctuation. And the proof of this Gaussian fluctuation is the main theorem of this paper. But if you have this, then we can construct some nice tests based on this. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, so first I well, because this is mathematics talk, uh, I need to explain a little more uh, in mathematics in this. Well, otherwise, if this were kind of statistics or engineering workshop, then perhaps I would, I would just skip this slide and go into the graphs and uh, the test itself. But anyhow, so this is the statement. And then this is the, uh, the sum of your uh, random variable because mu i is a random. And this is the mean. And if you subtract this mean from this sum, then this converts to Gaussian random variable. If you don't know about the random matrix theory, actually this is quite an amazing fact. Because in the central limit theorem, if you have n random variables and if you subtract this mean, then you need to, so the, the rise scaling is dividing by 1 over root 10. Right? So mean here in some sense like if you have 1 over n times this minus square root of n of this, then that will converge to the order 1 random variable, which is Gaussian. But here instead of dividing by uh, root 10, or actually multiply by root 10, actually you need to multiply by n. So uh, the central limit theorem type of thing here is actually in some sense stronger or weaker. I, I don't know which one is the right way to uh, saying it, but anyhow, so this has the different scale. And then uh, you can also compute this mean and variance, and the mean and variance is written in this complicated way, where this tau L, so well, this, this theorem is rather long, the, the, where this tau L is written as this integral, where this TL is the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind. So the Chebyshev polynomials, so actually uh, there are Chebyshev polynomials of the first kind and the second kind. The f for the first kind, this is orthogonal polynomial from minus 1 to 1 with this measure, uh, dx over uh, square root of 1 minus x squared. So you can either uh, define it by using the orthogonal condition like this, or you can also define this in this inductive way. And uh, a little history about this CLT for linear eigenvalue statistics. So if you have this object and this converts to Gaussian, and this was uh, actually very well studied for years if lambda is zero. So if there is no signal, then you have a purely random matrix, which is just a Wigner matrix. And in that case, the central limit theorem holds, which was proved by Bayer and Yao 
in 2005 and Litovan passed through in 2009. What happens if lambda is bigger than zero? Uh, in the very special case where the signal is just one over root 10 times 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, in the study of spin glass a few years ago, Jin uh, uh, in the University of Michigan and I wanted to have this, this type of central limit theorem. I, so I searched a lot. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the result. So I asked Shigang here whether he knows such a result or not. But um, he couldn't find one either. So I proved that. <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, paper contains the proof of the central limit theorem in this special case, when x is exactly like this. And uh, the only instance that, the, the only uh, other instance that the central limit theorem is known is if m is the adjacency matrix of sparse erdős range graph and f is some polynomial. This is also recent work by Banerjee and Ma. But then, if you, Think about this. Actually, this is very interesting and nice. Especially, this must be very useful in this problem because the variance does not contain anything about this lambda. But the mean contains this lambda. So, which means that if lambda is zero, you'll have the Gaussian. If lambda is non-zero, you will have a different Gaussian. But they are kind of separated because they have different means. So if you just take a look at two different Gaussians, first you can construct some test. So what's the test? So we introduce this function. Looks quite complicated, but um, this is actually very simple. So this was too simple so that I was hesitating to put the proof in the paper. Yeah, it's like two pages long, and the only mathematical tool I used in the proof is the Cauchy inequality. And then, from this function, well, with this phi lambda, we want to uh, construct this thing. And then that thing is just like this. But although this looks a little complicated, if you're given the data matrix M, then you can just compute uh, this matrix and uh, find the determinant and the log. And then the trace of M, well, it's computable. And trace of m squared, it's not that bad. So if you just put all these th things together, then you can compute the test statistics, test stati statistic, L lambda. Then what's our test? So this graph shows that we will have two different types of the distribution for that thing, L lambda. So if there is no signal, then L lambda will follow this distribution. And if there exists a signal, then the L lambda will follow this distribution. Then they are separated. So you can see the intersection point here. If your variable, L, your test statistic L is bigger than this point, then you have some reason to believe that there exists a signal. If your, test, your statistic L is less than this intersection point here, then you have some reason to believe that there exists no signal. So that's how you can do that. And if you do that, then you can find the error rate like this. Uh, looks a little complicated, but in the simplest case, if you have the Gaussian, then this W4 is 3, as I said, so this term will be gone, will be gone. And in the simplest case where the diagonal has the variance 2 over n instead of 1 over n, like the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, then this term will also be gone. So what's left is just 1 quarter times square root of log 1 over 1 minus lambda. So if we go back a few slides, then I showed you that um, theoretically the best error rate is like this, but we get the same thing. So this test is optimal because we get the same error rate. I don't know why this must be optimal, this, but this is optimal. <laughs> so that is that. And uh, one thing is that, so this error rate will become one in the worst case scenario if lambda is very close to zero. But then what does it mean by the error rate is one? Because we are adding two errors, like uh, uh, under the null hypothesis. So actually, there exists no signal, but we say that there exists a signal. So that's one type of error. And the other type of error is that actually there exists a signal, but we say that there is no signal. And we add those two probabilities. So if you just do the random guess, then error from the first case is 1 half. And the error from the second case is also 1 half. So the sum of the errors is just 1. So just a pure random guess will give you the error 1. 
And if the error is less than one, we are at least doing better than the random guess. And this shows that actually we are doing better than the random guess because this is always less than one. And this is the graph of this error rate. So if lambda is almost like one, this error rate goes to zero. And then it grows. So in, uh, in some uh, situations like lambda is somewhere in between, then the error rate is usually like 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Slightly better than random guess. But then if lambda goes to zero, it really goes to one. And uh, one other thing is that this test is applicable not just for the Gaussian case, but for any case. In those cases, W2 or W4 will be changed. And with those changed uh, parameters, you can also construct the same test. And also, you can uh, determine the error rate of this test and so on. And uh, some advantages. The first, this is optimal, meaning that if the noise is Gaussian, this really achieves the optimal error rate. But this is optimal in the other sense that this is the best test among all tests based on the linear eigenvalue statistics. The linear eigenvalue statistics means that you fix one function and put all the eigenvalues like this. So if you use this method, then this is the best test. I mean, this function is the optimal function we can use. So you can prove it, but um, that, that I, I, well, I don't think that's a very interesting part, so I will just skip that. And other things are universality. So this uh, error rate is universal in two different senses. So first, this is universal with respect to the choice of signal. And this is universal also with respect to the choice of the random variables. And finally, this is data-driven test. So even when the value of lambda is not known, you can just run the test. And then that is at least a little bit better than the random guess. OK, and then here comes the mathematics. So do you have any questions before we go into the mathematics? Uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, yeah. Uh, well, I just focus on the case where f is analytic, but this can be extended to kind of even uh, so some other functions. Like uh, definitely for smooth functions, it's OK. And I think with some suitable differentiability conditions, I think it's OK. But I, but I didn't go into the detail of such functions because anyhow, phi lambda is optimal and phi lambda is analytic. Yeah. So, so because this is optimal and this is analytic, I didn't go into the detail. And then for your formula, what if f equals identically one? Oh, if f, if f is identically one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So left hand side is n. Minus yeah. This is n, and this is also n. So you get just zero. Yeah, zero, zero, yeah. Zero is a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance zero. <laughs> yeah. So if you put the constant function there, then what happens is that uh, after some computation, you'll find that this tau 1, tau 2, and tau, all those taus are zero. So the variance becomes zero. <laughs> Well, of course, that, does, that doesn't give us any information because it's just simple zero and it doesn't say anything about the yeah, signal. Yeah. OK, so uh, mathematics. So uh, the proof of the central limit theorem is based on by Silverstein method or by Yao method. I, I don't know which one is a proper way of calling it. But uh, so this type of central limit theorem was first proved by Bai proved by, by and Silverstein for sample covariance matrices. But then that was extended by Bai and Yao for Wigner matrices. matrices. So, so you can, I, I think you can either call it by Silverstein or by Yao, but whatever. Uh, the, this method is very complicated, so this uh, contains mainly four different steps. And then, so it was like in the paper by Beck and myself for the spin glass theory. I, I, I told you that uh, the central limit theorem was proved by myself because I could not find any. And in that paper, actually, the proof of the CLT is much longer than the other parts. So even though the main theme of that paper was the, central, uh, the spin glass, the spin glass just appears slightly. And all the computations just were for the central limit theorem. So the computation is quite tough. But then, at least I need to follow the first step of this by Silverstein method. So I will just mention that. So we have this object. 
the sum of f of the eigenvalues, where f is some general analytic function, and mu j is eigenvalues. The problem is that the eigenvalues are random, and f is fully general. And we have two bad things together in the same thing, namely f of mu j. So it would be much better if you can decouple them, namely f is somewhere else and mu j is somewhere else, so you can just focus on the mu j first and then deal with f later. How? So if you have f of mu j, then that is the contour integral of f of j divided by mu j minus c, dz, which is very well known fact from complex analysis, undergraduate level analysis. <laughs> and then if you have this, then you can just change the order of the summation and the integral. Again, quite easy. If you have the sum of 1 over mu, mu j minus c, then instead of considering this, you can first form a matrix, which is m minus c i, the inverse, and then you can just compute the trace. Then that will give you this summation. And let's call this m minus c i inverse r of c. Uh, in operator theory, this is called resolvent of a given operator. And well, this idea is also very powerful in random metric theory in, in, in so many different aspects. But anyhow, so if you have this, then uh, one thing we know very well is that this 1 over n times trace converges to uh, this two chest transform of the semicircular measure, which is known as this. But we don't need that a lot here. But anyhow, so this is the first step. So we put all the randomness to this rz and f of z is separated. So we deal with this trace of rz first and then f of z comes later. And then the next scenario would be like, okay, then we need to compute the mean and we need to compute the variance and covariance and also some pro things. But, you know, mathematics, well, I, I always think that the mathematics is a theory of going back to what you know. So already I did computation like more than 20 pages to prove the central limit theorem for the simplest case where the signal is exactly one. So let's use it instead of computing mean and the variance and also all other things. How? So we kind of connect them. So the signal is uh, in this S n minus one, the, the unit sphere, uh, <coughs> the n minus one dimensional unit sphere. And then we join our signal and this uh, very simple signal on this sphere along a parameterized curve. I just put it here, the geodesic, but a geodesic is not that important here. As long as the length of this line is of order 1, it is OK. But anyhow, so geodesic is always of order 1, I guess, <laughs> because this is uh, uh, the, the sphere of radius 1, so that the geodesic always lies on the great circle. So this must be of order 1. And then we find a matrix which is like this. So root lambda of this y, y transpose plus h. y is the point on this geodesic, so y at the initial point is x, and y at the final point is 1. And we construct the matrix which depends on this parameter theta, and if theta is 0, then you get the original matrix, and if theta is 1, then we get the matrix we know with the signal 1. Okay, and R is the resolvent uh, for this M, defined in this way. And the claim is that the derivative of this trace R is much less than 1. If that is much less than 1, then, oh no, I think, yeah, if that is much less than 1, what happens is that this value at theta equals 1 is very close to this value at theta equals 0 because this was this from the previous argument of the decoupling. And this is not very far away from this because the trace of r at theta equals 1 is very close to trace of r when theta equals 0. So this is little of 1, but little of 1 will not be seen if you just compute the limit as n goes to infinity. So we just want to find this derivative with respect to theta. And you know, this is just simply you know, the fundamental theorem of calculus proved by Isaac Newton. And this is the contour, I think. And you can just think the contour in this way. So gamma is the contour like this, and all the eigenvalues are inside the contour. Now, we just do the, we just find the derivative. So y was like this. And then if you have this entry, uh, this matrix like m of theta is like root lambda times y, y transpose plus h. And if you 
pick one entry of this m, then m a b will look will be like root lambda plus y a times y b plus h a b. Now we consider the time the the theta derivative of this guy, and then this is just a chain rule. So you have the trace of r, but then trace of r, uh, the derivative is can be checked by the, the derivative of m times the partial derivative of r with respect to m. Now we have this times this, but then this can be ch directly checked from this. So you just put it here. And it is because h part does not depend on theta. The theta dependence only is in the signal part. So for the signal part, you have this, and then this is the derivative of this resolvent with respect to the matrix entry. Now, by your hand, you can compute the derivative of the resolvent entry with respect to the matrix entry. So this is not that hard. So I actually, so uh, well, time to time, I make some problems for the university mathematics competition. So I put this problem like two years ago, I guess. Yeah, so the resolvent, is, <coughs> so the inverse matrix is given and find the derivative of the inverse matrix entry in terms of the matrix entry. So if you differentiate this rjj with respect to mab, then that becomes rja times rbj with a minus sign. So this just becomes this, and then you have ya dot yb, and rja, rbj, but you have j in common, so this becomes r squared of ab. Now we have r squared of ab and ya dot yb, so in terms of the inner product, you get y dot, r squared, and y. If this is small, everything's done. So, I checked some literature, whether this is known or not. Uh, in the, the paper by Antti Knowles and Jun In in 2013, if you have this H minus CI, then for any given vector U and V, uh, the unit vector, this is very close to S of Z times U in a product with V, and the error is kind of small, big O of N3 minus 1 half. What is S of Z? It's not, it's not that important here, but S of Z was just this guy here, I mentioned here, but that doesn't matter much because if we have H minus CI inverse, so if you are to compute this value, then here in the U, what we had was Y dot, and here in V, what we had was this Y. But if you have Y dot and Y, the inner product is just zero right, from simple differential geometry. So that term will vanish, and the only remaining thing is, will be just this, which is much less than one. So we are all set. <laughs> this must be very simple, except we have two difficulties. First, unfortunately we have R, which is M minus CI inverse instead of H minus CI inverse. H is just pure Wigner matrix without the signal part. So we need to somehow convert the information of this H minus CI into R. And second, we have r squared instead of r. So if you can resolve two difficulties here, we are all set. How? So here's the first step. Because we have r, if you know what is h minus ci, we can convert this information in terms of r. How? So if you have r minus h minus ci, then multiply so, so R minus 1 is just M minus CI, and if you have M minus CI minus H minus CI, CI will cancel, so you have M minus H, which is just a signal. Now you multiply both sides by H minus CI inverse from the right, and R theta Z from the left. Then you get this, on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side you get this. Now you take the inner product with Y dot and Y. So you have Y dot, this guy, Y, and then you have Y dot, this whole thing with Y, but then you have y, y transpose, and you can separate this inner product into two pieces, namely this and this. Okay, and then you can just solve this equation in terms of y dot r, y. And y dot r, y will be given in this way, but now you have y dot h minus ci inverse y, but that was small. So this is small. Right, so simple. And then what happens? If you have r squared instead of, instead of r, the, the usual technique is that in complex analysis, everything is so nice. So even if you want to compute the derivative, you can actually just do it by taking the integration instead of the, you know, in, in, instead of the differentiation. How? Because of, you can just use Cauchy integral formula. But then, if you have r squared, actually r squared is just h minus ci to the minus 
2. But if you differentiate this with respect to z, then, sorry, I mean, if you differentiate this r theta z with respect to z, then you get just h minus z i3 minus 2, right? So if you have h minus z i3 minus 1, and if you differentiate it with respect to z, then you get the power minus 2. <laughs> and this is actually true by using the functional calculus or whatever. So this is what you get, and then you need to do this. So this is actually just this guy. But then this differentiation will become the Cauchy integration like this. So if you have a very nice bound on this guy, then you also have the very nice bound on this guy. So this is small because of the Cauchy integral formula. So because of the Cauchy integral formula, this is small, and then that's it. So that's how you prove this theorem. <laughs> okay. And then, so that is the mathematical proof, and there are um, several, some other stories. Uh, Okay, so if we go back to the original theorem I mentioned, uh, if you were, if you have some keen eyes, then you could see that this is like that, but then, no, sorry, uh, in the test, yeah. In the test, I said that if W2 is bigger than zero and W4 is bigger than one, we can define a test function like this. Why? Because if W2 is zero, then this will become infinity, and if W4 is one, this will become infinity. So what actually happens there? is that in that case, the hypothesis testing is much easier, not harder. Why? So, well, the error rate looks like this, and W2 is exactly zero, this will become infinity, and the ERFC of infinity is simply one. That means, with error zero, we can, detect us, we can do the hypothesis testing, meaning that actually the test is reliable. And likewise, if W4 is one, we have a similar situation. But then, of course, I need to say why. Why can it? Why we can do the reliable test in that cases? So the first one, when w two is zero, when w two is zero, we have this function and this function. But then, you know, variance is w two of this plus this plus this. But if w two is zero, you can make this first term zero and let the tau two and all the other taus are zero, and then the variance is zero. So you have just to pick instead of the Gaussian random variable. But if the means are different with two picks, then they are completely separated. So you can check the difference. And then the exact test is just this, the trace of M. Why? Because if you just compute the trace of M, then this will give you root lambda xi squared because the diagonal entries are just zero. Why, why is it picked? You have W2 equals zero. Yeah. And you still have those other terms. So you can, you can choose f so that tau 2 of f is 0, tau 3 of f is 0, and all the, taus, all the tau l's are 0. That happens when f of x is exactly x. When f of x is exactly x, then all the terms here are 0. Tau 1 is not 0, but w2 is 0, so the variance is 0. In that case, f of x is x, but then f of x is x means that you just sum the eigenvalues. And if you just sum the eigenvalues, that's just a trace. So if you come to the trace, everything is just okay. And this is, this is indeed okay because the trace of m is just simply sum of the square root of lambda times xi squared, but xi squared sum is just one. So you get exactly square root of lambda and you can recover the signal. If w4 is one, so there exists, so if, you, if your mean is zero and variance is one, then there exists only one random variable whose fourth moment is one, namely Bernoulli one half. So it's either one or minus one with probability one half, with equal probability. And in that case, this says that this tau two is not, so this w4 is one, so this term will always vanish. So if you can make tau one zero and tau l zero for l bigger than or equal to three, then variance is just zero. How? Because, so just, you can just keep this tau two alive, but then the simplest case for us in this case is that f of x is x squared. And then tau two is non zero and all the other taus are zero, and all the other terms will vanish, but you only have tau two. But tau 2 will again vanish because w4 is 1. 
So we are all set. And in that case, this is the sum of the eigenvalue squared, and that is just trace of m squared. But then trace of m squared is just the sum of all n trees squared. Because this is a Hilbert Schmidt norm. And then that, well, with some complicated things, this will give you exactly lambda here after finding w2 and n minus 1 and so on. So this is done. And finally, uh, this is kind of a um, different type of idea that if the sum of xi's are not of order 0, well, I mean, not of order, if that is some sum of xi's are not small, then actually you can detect the signal. Why? So, for the simplest example, if xi is a random variable of order, say, uh, of order, what can I say, o of order 1 over root 10, but if it is not mean 0, then the sum of xi's will become like c times root 10, where c is the mean of those xi's. Right, because you have n of them, if you use this lar a law of large numbers, that will become c of root 10, c times root 10. And if c is non-zero, then this sum of xi is quite large. In that case, you can just sum all the entries. And then the sum of the entries will give you c squared times root lambda, root lambda times n, and small order terms. So from this information, you can recover lambda. But then the problem here is that sum of all the entries have nothing to do with the eigenvalues. So this test is not based on eigenvalues. So this is an example that in some cases, not just using eigenvalues, but something else will give you more information on the signal. Okay. So this is the case of the biased spike. And finally, uh, some numerical type of thing. Uh, so if lambda is not known, so we somehow know, we somehow uh, kind of suspect that there might be some signal, but we don't know anything about the strength of the signal. So lambda would be there, but maybe it's not there. But if you find the largest eigenvalue, you can at least check whether lambda is bigger than 1 or not. But unfortunately, suppose that there exists no signal, at least in that sense. So lambda is less than 1. In that case, what can you do? So in, if you follow this strategy, then perhaps we can just pick one p here, and then just construct a test by using the t in the place of lambda. I mean, you can just compute this phi t instead of phi lambda, and then form a test statistic like this, and then this will give you the number, and using that number, you can also run the same test. Now the question is, what is the best choice of t? And then uh, I wanted to do some uh, nice computation with analysis, but unfortunately I couldn't do this, so I, I ran the Mathematica. <laughs> So if, the, if we know that lambda is uniformly distributed from 0 to 1, and then the best choice of t is 0 0.688, something like that. And in that case, the average error is 0 0.769, something like that. So this is at least better than the random guess. Yeah. And if we know the uh, prior distribution lambda in different way, then perhaps you can just run the same thing like this, and then that gives you also some different type of number t for the adaptive test. Okay, so those are the things in the future works include that uh, we can first construct a better test by using the n-twice transformation. So here, this, uh, unlike the random metric theory, we can do anything. I mean, in random metric theory, you can just compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But here, we are allowed to do anything with the entries. For example, if you just add all the entries, then that's a little different from what you do in the random metric theory. But in some cases, that gives us some nice information on the signal. So you can do some entry-wise transformation, like you know what people do in deep learning. So if you have entries, then you can put it in some weird function. And then you can construct a new matrix. And from the new matrix, if you do something else, then first you can detect the signal even better way. But of course, it cannot beat anything I mentioned that, uh, in the previous a few slides because we, kn we know that, at least for the Gaussian case, we cannot do better. The second one is then, of course, well, if you have rank k spike weakness model instead of rank 1, so there are k signals, then perhaps you can do a similar thing here to detect the signal. And yeah, so currently I'm doing this and this as well. And then uh, finally, uh, at least for statisticians, uh, the sample covariance matrix, or the Wishart case, is more interesting than the Wigner case. So in that case, we can also do something similar, 
So, we, uh, so I want to extend this result to the rectangular case in the, in the, in the research matrix. So those are the things, and uh, here are some references. So the first one uh, by Montanari, Reichmann, and Zaituni was about the impossibility of reliable tests for uh, by using all the eigenvalues, and uh, this is uh, how you can improve the cutoff threshold by using the enterprise transformation, and this is uh, the fundamental limits of detection in the spike with the model, so the best error rate by using the likelihood ratio test. And uh, if you want to check more detail about the proof of the central limit theorem, you can uh, read this paper, although this doesn't say anything about the random matrix or the central limit theorem. As I said, main part of this is the central limit theorem. And finally, the, the work I mentioned today is contained in this paper, uh, which was written very recently. And I also would like to acknowledge that this, sub this work was supported by Samsung Science and Technology Foundation. So thank you very much for your attention.